I'm Jason Camelio, and I'm joined by my co-host and co-producer for Global Connections, Ray Soule. We're from the Office of Global Initiatives at Berklee College of Music. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this edition of Global Connections. This is a series of um, online sessions as we're uh, in sort of still in lockdown mode for COVID, but I think we're just going to keep doing this because it's just so much fun. It's a great opportunity for us to connect um, our audience all around the world, our Berkeley Global Partners. We've got a bunch of global partners here. We have a bunch of Berkeley alumni. We have people that have come to our Berkeley on the Road and Berkeley Latino programs here. We have people from the Inspired by Berkeley community as well. But it's a great opportunity for us to connect amazing teachers, artists, educators from the Berkeley community with you. And um, as we get into this session, I'll give you a couple of rules of the road. Our presenter today has a lot of cool information to share. So as we go through the session, if you have questions, you know, feel free to use the chat to capture, capture your questions and we'll um, refer to those when we get to our Q&A section. Um, we are recording the session and we will share it out um, once it's been edited and prepared. So after this session, we'll make it available for you to refer to because it's going to be a lot of detailed information. But also there might be students and uh, fellow teachers that are going to want to check this out as well. So please be sure to share that with them. If you want to learn more about what Berkeley's doing in the world, you know, you can always go to berkeley.edu slash global. I threw that link in the chat. Uh, you can read about our global partners and our programs. And um, I really encourage you to follow us, if you can, on social media to keep in touch. And um, these are our social media feeds here. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, you can also follow me. I'm on, on all those platforms as well um, as Jason Camillo. So please join us, join me there. You know, suggest ideas for Global Connections. Let me know um, what you're interested in learning about Berkeley or master classes that we might do online. So without further ado, um, we're going to do a session today on body mapping with um, somebody who's an incredible artist, educator, musician. Um, Doug Johnson's an American jazz and classical pianist. He's performed with Esperanza's Esperanza Spalding's group with Grace Kelly. He's been teaching at Berkeley and at Wellesley College, and he's also a regular clinician, artist, uh, you know, doing our Ber at our Berkeley Global Partner Institutions. He's taught some Berkeley on the Road programs as well, and he and I have traveled to a few places together. We've hit a, a few continents. Um, Doug's received his bachelor's degree from Michigan State University and his master's degree from the New England Conservatory, where he studied with Dave Holland and George Russell. He's performed extensively in the United States at major venues like the Jazz Standard in New York. He's performed in Europe, um, in, in London, Vienna, Berlin, Paris, Copenhagen. He's uh, even traveled to other places. We uh, actually uh, traveled together to Shanghai to a big festival there. Um, he's performed at the Montreal Jazz Festival. He's performed in Toronto at Tanglewood, Oslo, uh, festivals in Boston, Warsaw, and the Newport Jazz Festival. Um, artists he's been working with include Luciana Souza, He's performed with um, Shara, Shara Ravello, um, Millie Bermejo, the Grand Rapids Symphony Orchestra, and the Handel and Haydn Society. You can check out Doug's music. Um, a couple of records that you're going to want to get are Live at the Royal Garden. It's a fantastic album with bassist Edward Perez and drummer Harry Tangshek. Um, Harry's a Berkeley alum. Um, in Game Theory, featuring a couple of amazing uh, alums, Massimo Bilcati on bass and Take Toriyama on drums. You can go to Doug's website as well. Um, I'm going to throw that in the chat. It's DougJohnsonPiano.com. And without further ado, Doug, thanks for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jason. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, from whether it's a good morning or good evening. It's very nice to be with you. Um, it's to, to just to connect with the whole uh, Berkeley community. It's been it's been enjoyable and challenging teaching online, but one of the things that I think a lot of us miss is just that connection. So uh, I'm happy to be here for all those reasons. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to share some things about this uh, concept that you may or may not have heard of called body mapping. And hopefully after this hour, you have a, a good working sense of what that is and what this path of learning could, could do for you. Uh, both in terms of your life as a performing artist, as an instrumentalist, and also as a teacher. It's really empowering in all those ways. 
Um, and I will just get to the, the presentation PowerPoint I have just to, it's a more efficient way of getting some of this information across, I think. And if there's any problems viewing any of these things, please let me know, but I think it should work. Um, I really like to start off with this quote uh, by great um, linguist and intellectual uh, name that probably a lot of you have heard of named Noam Chomsky. Uh, the willingness to be puzzled by what appears to be simple and obvious. It's what opens the door to a serious inquiry that goes beneath the surface. And just to consider that for a moment, the, the willingness to be puzzled. So um, something that once we become adults, a lot of people don't particularly want to be puzzled. <laughs> In my experience, they want easy answers. They want to know just what the truth is that somebody tells them and just act upon that. But as musicians that are always willing, well, needing to learn um, new things and needing to go deeper into what we're already studying, uh, there's all sorts of times we're puzzled. We're opening a Beethoven sonata and trying to understand it. There's going to be, it, the answers aren't necessarily easy. We have to keep digging in. And um, if you really want to, if you really dig Jimi Hendrix, and you can't just read a book, you got to dig in and, and figure out what's going on. And there's lots of points where it's puzzling. And it's also true with technique. How do I get to another level? And there's just this other level, too, of willing, willing to be puzzled by things that are simple and obvious, things that everybody seems to know the answer about because they're so simple and obvious that it takes, it takes somebody else to be willing to, especially public, publicly, raise their hand in class and ask a question that everybody else seems to know the answer to. Um, and when we do this, it really opens the door to learning. And I would just ask you to consider what's more simple uh, than your hand. And why isn't this moving? There we go. Um, what's more familiar, certainly, than our hand? And it's, it's terribly easy to confuse familiarity with understanding. The people we're around all the time, we can just assume that we know everything about them. Our, our children sometimes think our lives only existed when uh, they've known us and <laughs> not realizing that there's whole internal lives that we all have. So we'll look at, we're going to look at our body in this way. So the idea of a body map, what that means, it's our internal picture of ourselves. And it's something we all have and we all have clearly in a lot of ways, uh, but it's just not something we talk about. So it's a curious thing to talk about, just like when you first find out that other people have an internal dialogue going on it's at first you think it was just you perhaps so an easy way to just access it if i say your elbow or your neck or your big toe as soon as i say that your mind goes to that part of your body and you have a sense of how that part of you works how it moves where it's located how it functions sometimes those pictures are clear sometimes they're not so clear um, but the truth is there's almost always some dissonance between your internal picture and, or your map and the reality of what that structure actually is. And the process of learning, uh, the process of body map is learning, is the resolution of that dissonance. So you find out uh, the picture you have of your hip joints or the place where your head rests on your spine is, is not accurate and it's off quite a bit perhaps or it's just really fuzzy. And then you get closer and closer to sensing and perceiving um, what you understand is there. And when we do that, the benefit is that we just move easier. We move with more freedom and ease, more power, uh, more sense of weightlessness. And as teachers, it's enormously beneficial because we can often understand uh, quite clearly why a student is having trouble moving with freedom, even though we keep saying, relax, 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 and sing, and feel the time, and relax. Uh, it, sometimes it's not so easy to relax when you think your elbow moves in a different place than it actually moves. Um, I'll go back. I should have said that first. Picture your knee. Imagine your knee, and think about your kneecap and the relation of your kneecap to your knee. Um, oftentimes, when people think of their knee, they pretty much 
kind of just picture their kneecap. And so when they stand, they line their weight over their kneecap and it puts a lot of pressure on the whole structure. Now just take a look at that. And I would guess unless you've had knee surgery and you've seen a lot of x-rays that this is kind of puzzling. And this, this goes back to the Noam Chomsky idea, the willingness to be puzzled. We can, we can easily go, yeah, it's a knee x-ray. What's a big deal? Um, but I think it's pretty crazy. Look at that kneecap. And doesn't it look like it's just floating out in space there? What else? Well, uh, probably most people have a sense that their kneecap has some more clear relationship to where the joint actually is, but it's way up high there. And another really remarkable thing is there's space between this joint. We might think one bone just pushes directly into the next, but the way that, that the forces are distributed through and around a joint is not just directly bone to bone, which is, uh, I, that's puzzling as heck to me. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and it's a really important thing to understand. So another one to consider is, well, we all uh, learned a lot about the world by stacking blocks uh, one upon another. And a lot of people talk about the spine like a stack of blocks. So, well, you need to have your head directly on top of all the other vertebra and that somehow that's, that's how that's functioning. Um, but immediately when we see an actual spine, we see it has curves in it, and that's a little puzzling because, well, if, if, uh, if I stack the block, uh, stack blocks and made the curves like that, it falls over. We all learn that. And then we see an actual picture, an x-ray, and what do we see? We see, once again, a, a, a bony relationships we call joints where there's actually spaces between. And caveat, when I say space, I realize it's not just a vacuum. There's there's a disc in there and there's fluid filled disc and things. But, but once again, the, the forces aren't simply just distributed bone to bone. There's a lot of complexity in the way the forces are distributed to, through the whole body actually. And we know that we're not required just to be in that one vertical position. Um, but instead, uh, all sorts of crazy positions are possible. Whether, whether we can each do <laughs> all those or not, we know they're possible. That's an important thing. Um, especially, uh, well, we don't need to stand on our feet if this person's resting on their elbows and their forearms and, and their spine is remarkably curved and remarkably curved here. So, so all sorts of things we know are possible. Um, another map that we have of ourselves is really sort of in a cultural inheritance, cultural, scientific, Western inheritance, I think all around the world. Um, is this idea, this kind of Cartesian idea that uh, we're, we can essentially understand ourselves as being like machines. So there's levers and there's motors and you put those things together and you have something like a crane as you move your arm around and a grasper in your hand. And here, here's probably a picture everyone has seen in some iteration, uh, middle school biology, that's how the body works, right? We have a lever and we have, uh, it's always the forearm, it's always the elbow moving. And we have this one motor unit here that shortens and that causes this load to, be, to move with the leverage. And what they don't tell you is actually the bicep crosses another joint up here and it's incredib incredibly complex. But I want you just to try this on Try this picture on and see how it makes you move when you picture yourself as a machine like that. So you have your arm in that position and you bend your elbow to lift something. Notice how very likely to create that image, to create that picture in, in a way that you feel, you have to lock a lot of stuff down. We, we, that's something we know about machines. If we have a crane, we can't have something like the spine we saw with a bunch of blocks that aren't even touching each other and are frictionless in the middle uh, so it all just slide around but we we need to have a crane that has a stable uh, central structure central tower that's going to just not move when, when the crane lifts something so as i bend my arm i'm i'm creating that kind of false stability in the body that's that's that we know is how a machine works I'm going to just quickly introduce another way of looking at the whole design of the body. 
uh, called Tensegrity, and perhaps some of you heard of Tensegrity. Uh, Buckminster Fuller created that name. Um, but this, there's a person I've got to know uh, quite well who's a brilliant scientist, physician, and created the idea of biotensegrity. Um, so the application of those principles to the body. So instead of looking at the body as just a series of bricks and levers, <clears throat> we actually have a much more dynamic kind of system. <clears throat> and one thing he likes to say is you don't bend your arm like we were just uh, playing around with. You reconfigure your body. So when you do move at the elbow in the general way we're considering, um, there are little adjustments that go on through the entire body. And let's just try that on. I'll, I'll get out of here just for a moment. Let's all try that on. Once again, <clears throat> if my image, if my map is that I'm somehow like that machine, then I'm going to lock my spine, I'm going to lock my shoulder, and just isolate that motion. And one thing you'll notice as you do that, and please everybody try this on, it's, it's uh, certainly, I can describe what I'm feeling, but if you're all trying this, it works even better. Um, <clears throat> there's a big energy cost to do that, to, to lock down my shoulder, to lock down my spine, to actually create that look that there's just this one thing moving, it takes a lot of energy. So look, let's consider this other idea that when I do bend my elbow, there's soft tissue, tissue movement, there's ligaments or tendons, there's muscles that are all moving in all directions. I, there's partly a flow going in this direction, there's a flow going in this opposite direction. My spine will rotate naturally just a little bit and <clears throat> immediately we get a motion that looks more, uh, people, my students like to say, more natural. Uh, well, what does natural mean? Natural means not isolation, natural means flow. If we see a cat move, uh, you never see a cat just move their arm in a frozen way like that. There's always some connection through the entire body. When we're moving in a way that feels good and feels really effective at our instrument or singing, uh, that's something we'll, we'll tend to say, you know, it feels relaxed, it's, it's easy, there's flow. And certainly we reckon, recognize that in great artists, musicians, dancers, uh, athletes. So let's go back and <clears throat> look at a couple more images. Hopefully I'll pick up at the same spot. Good. Um, so I've been mentioning tensegrity. That, that is a, one type of tensegrity structure. And what you'll see is there's this network of sticks and strings or cables and struts. And it has, uh, you, you can imagine as musicians that it has resonance. If you, uh, if you touch that thing, it's gonna, there's going to be a vibration that goes through the whole structure. If you move any one part, you can intuit pretty easily that all the other parts are going to move. And that's really an, the way our body is designed. If somebody is supple and they aren't locking, if you take their arm and move it, well, their shoulder's gonna move, their shoulder blade, their ribs, their spine, and it's gonna go, that motion is gonna go all the way through the body, um, just, just like this. But if they're blocked somewhere, they're locked somewhere, then that won't happen. Uh, in a similar way, we can, we're gonna really dig in looking at the hand in particular today. And in a similar way that uh, Dr. Levin said, we don't move our arm, we reconfigure the body. Um, lots of instruments that we need that we involve our hands, um, obviously piano, guitar, trumpet, clarinet. And remarkably, even if you're singing and that's your main thing, the way that you use your hands will affect how free you are with your breathing. If there's tension or locking in your wrist, in particular, your shoulder will lock and your ribs aren't going to move as freely. So considering, considering the hands is beneficial for everybody. So the same idea, we don't move a finger, but instead we reconfigure our hand. So what we're really looking at is how uh, is changing hand shape and how do we do that? So the first, first concept I just want to throw out there is a, something that I find to be really uh, a helpful construct to look at. Uh, and really make a distinction. So these two words, stretch versus extension. And if I, if we had a little more time, I think I would uh, just start a discussion on this, but 
since we're uh, it's a little compressed, I will just throw that out there. So these are two words, much like meter and time signature, that can be used interchangeably. You can say the meter is three four, or the time signature is three four. But ultimately, <clears throat> meter has some other implications in terms of hierarchy of, of, of and flow of beats and uh, direction from beat to beat and things like that. The way it dances, right? So. Uh, in a similar way, stretch and extension, we can sometimes use those terms interchangeably, but ultimately they have really, really important distinctions. Um, dancers talk about extension. So the way they open their hand and their fingers open, um, if, if it's connected to the whole body, it's a really, it's, it's part of the, the aesthetic look of, of dance. And, but if somebody stretches out the end of their fingers, and tries to imitate that, it's not going to work. It's a completely different thing. So working definition, uh, to stretch is to move away from a fixed point. Um, and we can, we can look at that a couple different ways. So just, and it's, it, it happens in, um, all through the body. So if I just reach out with the end of my fingers like that, uh, an unfortunate thing that pianists often say is, how far can you stretch? And as soon as, as soon as the cue is a stretch, then it, it, there's going to be a limitation and trouble. So if I just take the ends of my fingers and reach out, that creates a lock back in my palm. And so that's a fixed point. And then my fingers are trying to move away from that fixed point. And it creates a lot of tension in the hand. If I look at that point right there in my hand and that point right there, and I reach out from those points and creating fixed points there, I can be reaching in this direction and then my uh, shoulder blade locks, and then I create the stretch there. I can go a little further and I go through my shoulder blade, but the middle of my back locks, and then I end up with a common place of discomfort, which is like right, right on the inside of the shoulder blade. My hurt, it hurts there for some reason. So if the opposite of stretch would be then um, to extend. So literally extend means to make longer. So if you think about picking up a chain off the floor, uh, as you're moving, you get another link off the floor, another link, another link. So functionally, the chain you have keeps getting longer and longer. So as I move out, if one more part moves in the shoulder, then the shoulder blade, and then the ribs, and then the spine, and the hip joint, all the way till that motion eventually stands me up, which is a very th different thing than just standing up. My impulse to pick something up creates movements and makes makes me longer functionally all the way till I get the floor and then it actually starts walking me. And when we go to our instrument like that, extending and extending, we're going to get connected down to the ultimate support of the floor. So that's a, a really helpful concept in communicating and understanding that, that movement. So uh, I, I think this says it very, very well in images. Uh, this pianist is uh, one of the great 20th century, early 20th century pianists, Josef Hoffmann. And uh, this, this picture grabbed off the internet is clearly has a lot of tension. There's that reaching out of the end of the fingers thing that we were, I was just describing. But uh, look with Hoffmann, he's, uh, that's like a minor ninth, right? F sharp to an A. Um, and there's no sense in looking at that, those hands that there's tension in there. So much of what we talk about wanting to do is not have tension or release tension. The way that he's initiating that movement doesn't create tension. The way the other person here is initiating that movement is creating that locking and tension. Um, a real tell is that uh, the ends of the fingers, there's no reaching out, there's no desperate pulling out at the end to try to get somewhere. But instead, these fingers are being carried out there, opened out there from all the way back into this area and this area. So it's not just about this part of the fingers too. Another real tell, just viscerally we will notice this, whether we're conscious of it or not, is what happens to the fingers that aren't being used. So, you know, these fingers might be the ones reaching out, but the fingers in the middle results, the result is they get locked and tight. Um, and Hoffman's middle fingers, 
they're just they're just as easy and relaxed as if the hand was just in a neutral position by his side. So there's not a, there's not a locking or tension created through the palm or through the wrist or through these other fingers by the way he's opening his hand. And that's that's the extension versus stretch. Um, and just a couple other images of this. This is, uh, you know, the cute cat picture time of the presentation. But it really, it's really perfect. This is how Horowitz gets out over the piano. There's no part of this cat structure that's that's doing more work than any other. Uh, it, there's the contribution of every part to have his paw just hovering over the keys. He's not ready to drop and collapse his arm and use some weight to make the sound. He's just there to be able to move and do it, which is much more like a Tai Chi master will do. And this happens to be my daughter when she could just barely reach the keys, but even still, there's, there's that balance on the floor and that extension all the way through and her head is free to balance on her spine. Uh, and I just, well, I, I love both those pictures. This is a student I uh, got to work with in Brazil at the University of Brasilia who is having a violinist who's having chronic pain in that area between her shoulder blades. And by working on the conception of movement and really working on the way she used her hand specifically, um, it looks like she's kind of a Tai Chi master now. This was this really pretty quick transformation. But notice she's playing with the movements, how she uses her hand, hands and the relationship between that movement and then the flow all the way through her body. So there's no, it's a constant uh, extending, it's a constant um, reconfiguration. So that idea that she's not moving any particular part, but she's constantly reconfiguring her body. Um, and with a sense that any position could be, that, that's the position she's in and that's balanced and she could stay there and she's reconfiguring, reconfiguring, and at any point, yeah, she's balanced, she could stay there. Whereas if you just bend your arm while you're locking down your body, your bicep's going to get tight and it's going to feel cramped and it's, uh, you're not going to want to do it very long. Um, so let's, let's dig into some detail a little bit, a little more exploration. If we're going to figure out um, how we change the shape of the hand and how we can reconfigure the hand, then we should probably get a sense of what the hand is. And, um, and well, it's kind of like, well, if that's a hand that Jocko has there, what the heck is, do I have at the end of my arm? And how could that even be possible, how he's moving? Well, uh, I can't guarantee well, everybody would be able to move like Jocko right away, but, um, but let's, let's take a look. Um, First of all, what I want you to do is take a look at the back of your hands. So I'm going to I'm going to do some demonstrations here, and I realize we're really we're very used to looking at things and wa you know watching them happen. But I'm going to demonstrate, and at the same time, I encourage you all to just try this on your own. So as you look at the back of your hand, consider how long your fingers are. Consider what you're getting. What's the visual message you're getting on how long your fingers are? And if I ask people to tell me what their two shortest fingers are, probably uh, about 95% of you will give me the same answer and some people will have some other ideas and that's fine. But let's look at this as a hypothesis, right? So that's, we even call this the little finger, right? So it's probably one of the small fingers. There's my little finger and there's my thumb. So there's that picture of that. There's this picture here. Um, now, I want you to try on something different, which is in this case, you're going to look at your palm. And what I want you to do as you're looking at your palm is to bring the, the faces or the pads of your thumb and your little finger together. So you're going to bring them together like this, and then you're going to open them back up. And do that repeatedly, opening all the way up and bringing them all the way in. And observe both of those fingers, but in particular, observe your thumb. And how long, how long does your thumb appear now? Is it the same? Does it look the same as it did when you were looking at the back of your hand and holding your hand still? And uh, why don't you just, people, hold, up, hold your thumb up to the screen and, and just with your fingers, show, show what you're seeing is how long your thumb is now. So 
but so with your other hand. I don't want to. So here, before we were looking at a thumb that was that long. Is that still what you're seeing, or do you see something different? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so when we're moving our thumb so our fingers meet, it's pretty easy to see that, well, what the thing that's moving is a lot more than what seems to be the structure when I just look at, look at it statically. So the thumb is twice as long, and this is a really significant thing for, for making music on all sorts of instruments, and as I said, even, even singing. This, so we have a tool in our toolbox that's different than we thought, or we, have a, we just have a different tool than we thought. It's twice as long, but another really important thing is this joint is one of the most mobile joints in the body. So just try moving your thumb around in a circle a little bit. And you'll notice that it makes a grand circle around. Uh, so instead of having a stubby thumb that moves just in one plane, we have a twice as long thumb that moves in a grand circle. Um, the, the way this can play out negatively is if at the piano, I picture that thumb. If I'm on my second finger's on, say, a middle C, and I go to play B flat with his thumb, I'm going to tend to move from that joint where it appears that my thumb originates from. And as soon as I reach out from there, what have I done? I've created a fixed point and I've stretched out from it. It locks the rest of my thumb and it locks my wrist. And then I'm going to need to do these kind of things when I'm playing because I don't have the ability to, to move from where the, the, the thumb actually moves from. So instead, if I have the ability to play a scale where that thumb is continuously moving around in a circle, then I can draw my arm up the piano just like a, a cello bow across the strings. Um, the, next, next, what I'm going to do is, it's, I call it appealing to a higher authority. I mean, obviously everybody's here to learn and you appreciate the information and I appreciate that. But if I can show you something uh, something that really shows it even more clearly that's for the best so i'm going to show you uh, and i just want you to bring your attention to i'm so glad they polished this piano skull board otherwise we wouldn't be able to see his pants uh, but we get this great reflection look at art's thumb and he's playing do, re, me, do, re, me, and his hand is, well, you just, you'll see it. Here we go. Look at that thumb there. Let's, uh, I think, I'd like to see it again. Let's see. Oh, that's, let me, let me try again. I hope that's working for everybody out there. Oh. It's freezing for me right now. Um, I'm just going to check in. Did, did it, what, was it clear there for, before it froze a bit? Yes, yeah, we were able to see it. Excellent, excellent, okay. Um, when I, when I show that to people, it's, I, pretty much everybody's amazed by it. Uh, obviously, it's Artatum and maybe one of the greatest pianists of all time. But I, to me, one of the striking things about it is watching his hands, it, it looks different than most of the pianists that when you see them play. And if you're a pianist, you might think, well, it looks a little different than my hands when I play. But I think we can safely say he's doing everything right. <laughs> if we can figure out, if we can puzzle that out once again and try to understand what he's doing, what looks different, and how can we understand that, that can be an empower, empowering thing. And one of the clearest is this, this idea of the thumb. So he clearly has his thumb maps as that full structural unit. It looks to me like a tool. It's almost like an external tool that he's using, he's moving to make those sounds. He's never using any action out in these joints. He's always carrying, so he's using that the longest lever possible to, to, and his hand is quiet. When you watch Horowitz and Rubenstein, it's the exact same thing, it looks the same. Um, so that's, 
that's a really good functional experience to, to understand what this, pro this process is about. We, we all have internal maps. <clears throat> if I say uh, your left thumb to anybody, they are going to have some picture of it. Oftentimes, the picture they have is, uh, in this case, clear and super clear and exactly wrong. And the, the relevance of this is it's not a trivial thing. It's not just learning anatomy. The relevance is we actually move um, to try to make our maps true, essentially. We move according to the picture we have of ourselves. And there are things like this all through the body uh, that can, that are, they are very interesting, but more than that, they're relevant and they can make a really big difference in how much freedom we have. And on the other side of it, if we resolve that dissonance between the picture we have and the reality, we're going to leap forward. And that's the other power of this. Um, so much learning that we experience is that we picture for, I mean, when we say practice, I'm practicing, um, or, you know, ideally our students are saying, I practiced every day this week. Um, what, what we're assuming there usually is that there's going to be gradual growth. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. And it happened, you know, it, we can count on that happening. Uh, you start at a slower tempo and you gradually move the metronome up. So you retain ease and you can play fast comfortably. That's a, that gradual kind of process. But there's also the, the people who, in particular, who are older in this group, but I think it probably everybody has a sense of this. We can practice steadily, but we also get to certain points and we, we stop. So we can't, in certain areas, we don't just keep getting better. There's going to be limitations that we reach. And uh, students, when they come to Berkeley, have a, the challenge of practicing in practice rooms so they can hear other people next to them. And they, they can be doing well, but they listen to somebody next door and it's like, wow, that's just a whole nother thing. There's an ease and a freedom and a velocity and dynamic, dynamic range that I just don't have. And it doesn't seem to be just a matter of a little gradation. Sometimes it's just a, a whole different kind of tone production. A trumpet player that can play a high C and one that just can't. That's not, that's not usually just moving up by half steps. That's, that's learning a different way of, of, of approaching the instrument. So what I'm really getting at here is these are paradigm shifts. This is, this is a, an example of where if my understanding shifts, it's going to remove a block, and then I'm going to be able to sometimes leap forward. But then also, I'm going to be able to continue that gradual growth that was happening before I reached this block. So that's... That's the power. Um, let's uh, go back to here. OK, so why do we have these? How do we end up with these maps or these pictures? Well, the one we just looked at with the thumb um, is a good example of just visually, I see something. And even though the thumb goes from there to there, uh, this, the visual looks like it just starts there. And this, this, this kind of webbing and muscle here clouds the fact that the structure goes further. Another thing can be how language affects our understanding. So this part of the hand where this uh, child's hand is sitting is the palm. And uh, palm, palma, all the Romance languages are very similar. Similar to those palmos, palme. And then I'll do my best here, uh, sonbadai. Shojang, uh, uh, unless I've inadvertently said something I shouldn't, I think in different languages, we have a single word for that single part of the hand. And that, that sure implies that that is a thing, that that's a structure, the palm. When, in fact, what we can see in looking at this x-ray, well, where is the palm? All of a sudden, I don't see a palm. I just see fingers that are strangely long. Um, so the little finger that we see as little finger is this thing right there. But when we look at this skeleton, well, actually, I mean, it goes all the way to there. It just does. There's no other way to understand it. Um, and then it connects to this ball of bones, which is a wrist. And hopefully, we'll get to time to look at that a little as well. 
Um, so fourth finger, middle finger, and there's, there's the thumb we were just looking at. You can see, yeah, that connects down to these wrist bones. But it isn't just the thumb that's longer than it appears. It's all of the fingers are much longer. And this area that we call palm is actually a collection of, of finger bones. I call them hand finger bones, uh, just because I think it's easy to understand. But just to give you the term as well, the wrist bones are called carpals. Sadly, most people, I think, know that name because of the carpal tunnel uh, disease disorder. Um, but the, they're, they're carpal bones, and they're designed to be mobile and uh, remarkably uh, flexible and mobile. And the bones beyond these carpal bones are called metacarpals. So these metacarpals are mobile in relation to one another. And we're just going to do a little movement to, to explore that. Um, I, we're just going to put our hand in two different positions. One is first, think about you're out at a mountain stream and somewhere in Argentina and wine country. That sounds like a good thing. And, um, and you want to drink. So you make a cup with your palm. You make a cup with your hand. And you take a drink. And in contrast to that, you're holding a little bird that you've raised from an egg and you want, it's time for it to fly away. So you take it and you open your palm and you send it out so it flies off your palm. Just, just tr transform your hand or reconfigure your hand between those two shapes, those two organizations. So you have a cup and you have a flat hand that you send that bird away. So what is moving uh, when you change your shape? How are you changing the shape of the hand? Um, your fingers, these external things we're, that we call fingers, they're not the thing that's changing shape to do that. What's changing shape are the, the hand bones, the, the metacarpals that make up your palm. And I just want you to get a sense of these different bones. Take, take the knuckle behind your little finger here and push it forward and back and notice how flexibly that moves compared to the knuckle right next door. And what you're really doing then is you're moving that fifth finger metacarpal. You can take the whole side of your hand as well and move that bone. So when you open up your palm, what you're doing is you're moving that fifth finger bone out in that direction to create that flatness. And if you're moving in the other direction, you're moving it across towards your thumb and that's creating that cup shape. And the, the fifth finger metacarpal is the most mobile bone in the hand uh, of those hand bones. But you'll notice the fourth finger bone is quite mobile too. The, the stadal center is really your pointer finger and, and connected into the third. And in relation to that, your thumb opens and your thumb comes in and your fifth finger metacarpal opens. But that's an incredibly different picture. And I'm, I'm just going to see if this Art Tatum video works again. Because um, I'll have you try a little something, and then we'll 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 watch it. Um, so we've looked we've looked at that freedom of the left hand thumb and how he was using that tool. You can try that on, see what that feels like. But now imagine you have a small ball held like you're a magician, and you're palming something in your the palm of your hand there by making that shape. And you don't just have it in there, but you're actually going to roll the ball around. If I roll a ball around in my palm, notice my fingers move. But if somebody just tells me to move my fingers, I'm likely to go like that, kind of flail them around. But if instead I roll the ball in the palm, so I'm moving those metacarpal bones in my palm, that's actually resulting in me moving my fingers. And what you'll notice is our Tatum plays those runs, it's exactly what it looks like. It looks like he's rolling that ball around. Um, okay, so Cross your fingers that this will work. Uh, wow, I'm having some. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Watch the right hand.
Okay, so yeah, it's largely the movements of these bones in relation to one each other, reconfiguring the hand constantly and relating that all the way down to the wrist that's creating most of that movement. Not all. There, of course, there's movements here too, but there's really no movement out here. So uh, a different picture, different map that creates different movement. Something you can just try on. Uh, if you're going to bring your second finger or your middle finger in to touch your thumb, notice that that movement isn't something that's happening out here. It's something that traces all the way through the whole structure. And when you feel that, it's a different thing. Um, so we'll, now's the time for your book. Take whatever book uh, you you find. If, if, if you only have kind of a Berkeley, Berkeley Press softer book, you can use that, but just keep it, keep it solid with your other hand. So we're going to start with our hand in a neutral position. And when I'm saying neutral, I'm really meaning that the position, if you're just walking down the street and your hand's hanging by your side, uh, it's going to be something like this. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the book up to my hand, up to my palm, and I'm just going to press into it and just let my hands flatten out on the book. But the trick with this is that I'm not trying to stretch my hand open. We're trying to get rid of that idea. But instead, I'm passively pressing the book into my hand and just letting that flatten out my hand. And you can feel the fingers are flattening out. But a big thing that is necessarily flattening out as well is that your palm is opening up. And so now we'll just reverse the process, lower the book slightly, and let your hand go back to that neutral position. And in that position, my fingertips are very close together. So I can be in a position that's closed in the sense that my fingers are close together, but I still have a sense that there's openness in my palm there. So, and then on the other hand, I still shouldn't have said that. On the other hand, we have pressing the book up into the palm. And now we're going to try another thing, is that I want you to take the book away, but simply keep your hand in this exact position. So your hand, first off, I would, I would guess that everybody's hand is very relaxed and comfortable when the, other, when the book opens up your hand. You didn't have to strain or stretch at all to get in that position. Um, so keep in that position, no strain, but just whatever effort is required to keep in that position. And then notice what, what, how your hand is organized. We've reconfigured the hand. And now your hand is probably in a position that you're pretty close to an octave on the piano, just as kind of a universal measurement. It might need just a little more. But think about what it usually feels if, you're sit, if you sit down at the piano and you say, I want to make go to an octave. And do you have any sense that you're reaching out or stretching or tightening? And then let's just go back to this again that if the book passively opens up the hand and really opens up the palm, kind of focused on pressing into the palm, that that opening of the palm actually carries out the fingers. And when I do that, I didn't tighten my wrist. I didn't tighten those palm uh, muscles and the, the, the bones in relationship to one another. And because I didn't do that, my shoulder didn't lock. And then maybe I'm going to conduct like that. And I have, uh, I'm modeling something that is healthy and it's going to be a lot easier for a violinist to play uh, or the big man to play and breathe well than if I'm tightening and locking in my wrist because then I'm modeling a whole different type of movement. Um, I know we're getting towards the end of time. I'm just going to, should I do one more exercise, Jason? Or um... Yeah, if you have time, if, if folks are cool, let's do one more and then maybe a few questions. Cool. Awesome. Um, Okay, so hand picture, another image here. We've looked at some skeletal uh, images, uh, x-ray images to give a sense of the structure. And we know, we know a bit more, right? That the, the thumb actually goes down to here and we have these metacarpal bones in here. But let, let's just take a look at this line right here. This is an incredibly, once again, familiar. It might not mean we really understand it, but it's a very familiar thing. So. It sure looks to me like the finger starts there because I got that nice marker 
and that's a little that's where the little finger is. Fourth finger starts there, third finger there, second, and for the guitarist, first finger, second finger, third finger, fourth finger. They they start there. Um, okay, so now what I'd like you to do is uh, have get in this position. So your thumb is pointing right at you, and then bring your other hand around in front. And what I want you to do is put your finger, like so let's say your middle finger, on top of one of those knuckles. You could pick the third, the, any of those two in the middle. So you, I'm going to have my third finger on that knuckle, and then I'm going to put my, my thumb on the other side of that knuckle. And, uh, so I, and, and I want to move that finger around a little bit so I can feel uh, that I have, that that's where the joint is. I mean, I'm getting a real clear tactile sense. That's where the root of that finger is. That's where it begins. And notice you can move it in different directions. You can move it up and down. You can move it side to side. And you can move it in a nice big circle. A really important thing for fun hand function is that we have circular motions, not just at the thumb, but all those fingers. Okay, so now for, that's the big reveal. Keep your, your, your uh, hand on the knuckles, whichever hand you're holding here, and then you're going to turn this over, and I want you to see where your thumb is. So keep your hand right where it is, and look where your thumb is in your palm there. So just so I can show people that if, in case somebody didn't do it, notice uh, how far that is down from the line. So it appears my third finger starts there, but what I've just shown myself by feeling this is, well, no, it, it comes, it actually starts way down there and it moves so freely from down there. So once again, there's, there's this difference in appearance and, and, and the actual structure. And what's, what's the relevance of this? Well, for a lot of people, that, pic, that picture of the lines there is really compelling. So when they go to move, they try to move from there. And let's just, let's just do that experiment. Now, looking at your palm, um, try to move your middle finger from that line. You can touch it so you can just get, get a, some sensory feedback. Uh, if I move up and down, well, there's, there's tightness and strain. Side to side is really uncomfortable. A circle is also really uncomfortable. Now, go back to holding that, the center of the joint. Just show yourself where that is. And you'll find there's actually a nice marker a line in the hand for that too. Um, now up and down, side to side, and big circle around. And notice how much easier that is to move. And then also consider that look that Tatum had. Uh, he wasn't moving fingers like this. He had these fingers that were coming very clearly from that, the, the joints where they actually move. And he was moving that little ball around in his palm appearance wise. Um, so I hope, I hope that some of these different exercises gave you a clear sense of this, not just intellectually, but a feeling in your body and a, and a shift in feeling that, that went along with the understanding. Um, for, the, for the final thing, just which is a, probably the most relevant question, is, well, how do I do this? How do I learn this? How do we put this together? How do I teach this? Um, the most important thing to understand is that our, the map that we're looking at is not an intellectual thing. It doesn't reside in our conscious mind. It's a physical thing. It's a visceral thing. So um, just the fact that we've learned something new, that, for example, that I've learned that my thumb is actually this long, it doesn't mean when you sit down at your instrument tomorrow automatically you're going you're gonna to have that map shift and you're just going to move with that new found freedom. You, what you have to do is change your work on your visceral map. And the way we do it is actually quite simple and direct. That, but the thing is we have to talk the language of the body. We have to speak to our body directly. And that's sensory experience. That's movement, sensory touch. Um, so it's not just thinking, in other words. So if I take my other hand, if I, if I want to work on this here, if I take my other hand and I explore uh, the thumb. And this, this goes right back to the Chomsky. You got to be, you got to be willing to be puzzled about something that seems simple. I can see sometimes with my students, there's like, I, you're asking me to play with my thumb. That seems silly. <laughs> but, but when you realize 
we actually that's 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 pretty interesting and it's puzzling and the fact that you don't know your thumb should blow your mind uh, so yes yeah, so you 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 palpate you move around you find where the joint is if, if i move my thumb like this take the whole thumb i'm getting loads of sensory experience i'm getting the experience from my right hand coming in contact here and moving the thumb um, i'm also getting the experience in this hand of that passive movement so i feel how easily it moves and then i can say well what if i moved that easily just like my other hand is moving it and that can become the model and over over weeks you can really make make the shifts to so it then becomes part of your vocabulary and i'll wrap there any questions thanks Doug. yeah please feel free to unmute or raise your hand or you can throw a question in the chat now is a great time to um you know, connect in here with Doug and, and Ellis, what do you got? Go ahead. You can unmute, sir. No, no, no. I, I didn't um, 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 have a question. I just wanted to say thank you so much. I, I, I really enjoyed this. It gave me a, a, a very new and fresh way of looking at things. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got one question. Go ahead, Hosner. Hmm? Go ahead. Okay, I have one question. I wrote, I wrote Doug privately, privately about it, but it's regarding at least stretching and warm up, but it has relation with body mapping. So okay, the, the, the concept of body mapping, I understand that a whole arm, even a tiny muscle, moves the whole arm. Do I have to stretch my whole arm to just use the fingers or the ankles, whatever? Or do I have to train that area specifically? Um, great question. So if... <laughs> My, my sense is if somebody's going through some sort of uh, specific issue with pain or, or tightness, then definitely, definitely stretching can play a role in recovery. Um, and and I, I, I would defer to any of your individual teachers if they have something they'd like you to do before playing in terms of stretching or something. However, what's going to be, what's going to be really optimal is something that people have been talking about with athletes for a while is that instead of doing a lot of what they call static stretches which tends to weaken the muscles and limit the power and make an athlete less effective but instead is doing whole body movements that that warm up the entire body but that are gentle so if if you're a runner they can start walking a little bit and they can jog a little bit before they run full but they're but they're going to be using their entire body so, so movements that in, involve moving through your spine, moving through your shoulder, moving through your whole arm. So you actually feel those connections of movement that go up from, from your fingertip all the way down to the ground. And a big part of that is, is not even just warming up, it's a sensory thing. So as you're playing, can you feel the connection? Um, a lot of instruments, instrumentalists are just aware of their fingers. So can you be aware of your fingers through your lower arm, through your upper arm, into your shoulder, into your back, and into your rib movements? So the more you, more, the more you get connected sensorily, the more that you're just going to be warmed up and by the way you're moving all the time. I hope all that's right. It. Thank you, for your, thank thank you, you for your answer. Thank you for the question. He has a question that actually I posed to you a while ago, which is, you know, just looking at like the motion for a trombone player and people should know that Doug actually uh, was a trombonist as well at, at one point in his career. Could you talk about just like sort of the motion, even with like, you know, the slide position arm, you know, you're, you know, typically the right arm. Um, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I remember this very well. <laughs> the, so once, once again, to the sense of map, most people have a sense that their arm comes from here. And it's, as, I, as I do this, and I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, well, yeah, it comes from here. What are you talking about? <laughs> of course it comes from here.
in there. But actually, the arm structure is much more extensive. If we're talking about the skeletal structure, the, the collarbone connects where it connects into uh, the sternum. We have this joint right here. That's an important place where the whole arm structure moves. And in particular, the, the shoulder blade. Let's just uh, try on a movement here. If you bring your arms out to the side and bring them actually as far back as you can, you'll notice that your shoulder blades are coming together. And you can very intentionally pinch them together as tightly as you can. If you bring your arms out in front of you, you'll notice your shoulder blades protract. They come around to the side and they come forward. Um, now, I can be in this position where my arms are in front of me, and I can pull my shoulder blades in. And notice where I'm, I'm, I'm at basically at fifth position here. Now, if my shoulder blades are out to the side, I'm to seventh position, position. So, which is for non-trombone players as far as you need to go. So, having the shoulder blade clearly be mobile, and, and we have a sensory experience of the movement of that shoulder blade, but this is a very simple exercise to do. Just go through the full range of motion of just the shoulder blades with your hands to the side. And, and start off gently, but then work for end range of motion. Work to find out how far they go down, how far they go forward, how far they go up, how far they go back. You'll, get, you'll, you'll be working ranges of motion that, that probably they'll go in all regularly. And you'll also be getting that sensory experience of how the shoulder blade can rotate out to the side to support that movement of, of the arm. Makes it, and, and when you do that, it's, it, can really, it can really free up the ribs to move because the shoulder blades basically rest on the ribs. And a lot of people get the message that you're, they're supposed to hold the shoulders down and actually have the shoulders back and down. That's good posture. So as I have my shoulder blades back and down, I'm limiting the ability to move my arm freely, and my shoulder blades are pressing into my ribs, so the ribs can't move freely to play. This is a very different thing than saying just lift your shoulders. It's that your shoulders are really designed to be suspended. And oh, I wanted to show you this. This is, this is a tensegrity model. Um, and this, this is just shows so beautifully how this idea of interconnectedness in one part moves so every other parts follow. So similarly, I move my arm here, and then it connects into the shoulder blade, it connects into the collarbone. And I'm, I'm just focusing on the skeletal structure, but all of the musculature, all of the, the soft tissue, the, the fascia, that, that's also mobile, will connect you into that possibility of suspension and mobility. So hopefully that gets to some of it. Yeah, so um, this is, you know, as uh, Stephen from um, Silker College pointed out here, it's, you know, we're just breaking the ice, Doug. You know, you're just, <laughs> we're just working with the hand. Yeah, exactly. You work with your students. Doug, uh, Doug actually presents this class, Body Mapping at Berkeley. Um, it's a full semester long course that students take and um, it's very, it's getting very popular as more and more musicians, dancers, um, as well at the conservatory and other people are, you know, getting in, getting interested in how this is working. Um, Ellis posed a philosophical question here. I'm not sure if you want to touch on this at all, sure. but, you know, have you in, in your work and your experience, is this sort of applied to the way that you um, maybe approach learning music mentally? Is, are there, is there a corollary or an analog to um, how you uh, connect with the, the creative process? Absolutely, and I really, the, the thing that started me down this path was um, studying, studying with a teacher that ta basically taught me some of this, some of this information, and, but, but some of it was, was confusing, and I wanted to understand it better. But the thing is, he, he, he really taught music largely through movements. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't just having the sound in, in your mind, but, but actually, clearly, what's, what movements are, are, are the analog for what particular sounds? If you think about a conductor, that's all they have, right? <laughs> you, all you have is movement correlating with sound. But as musicians, that's, we, we all have that same thing, but sometimes we're not really aware of it. So the, the direct, the more directly 
the, the movements correspond. Uh, for instance, I'm a, obviously a pianist right now, and I, I, I think in these terms, but it applies to everybody, that if I play this note, and if somebody often will play kind of expressively in legato, and they'll, they'll do this kind of stuff. I mean, that motion, if you sing it, it would be bah, bah, bah. I, I mean, that, that doesn't want to play. But instead, if I'm on this key and I really connect from that support to this support, and what if I just think about it locally in my hand? Well, that's an improvement. But if, I, if that really connects through my forearm, through my shoulder, but even better, can I feel that connection down to the ground and then from the ground out to that finger? Well, if I'm experiencing that, the musical result is that much more complete. It's absolutely complete. So then I'm really resonating. My structure and movement is resonating fully with the simplest thing of connecting one note to the next. And uh, once again, Horowitz is one of my heroes. You can see Horowitz do that. Any, any two notes he connects, you can see it triangulate right down to the ground. So although in a sense, it doesn't really sound philosophical, but uh, perhaps, but, but to, to be completely resonant is an ideal, to be completely resonant and unified with the music through intention, the, the emotional connections and narrative, but, but the physical, physical complete resonance, uh, that, that's much more likely to lead to having your mind get out of the way and have that flow state appear because you're just you're just it's so directly connected. Very cool. Wow. Any other Thank questions? you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts, questions? Feel free to type them in the chat as well, or you can unmute and you know chime in. Cool. Well, Doug, this has been incredible. It's it's always great to. So you present and, uh, and and get into this. It's uh, it is deep, deep information. And um, you know, for those of you that are here, I, I seriously encourage you go out to Doug's website. It's in the chat, DougJohnsonPiano.com. He's got information about body mapping there. Um, you can check out videos of him performing. Um, Doug is available. So if your if your school is interested in having Doug present. You can reach out to him directly there to do master classes. Um, if you're looking to study, um, I'm sure he'd be interested to have a discussion with you. You know, we're, this is a great time to dig into a new topic like this, especially for um, all of us, you know, performing musicians who uh, find some challenges or looking to overcome some of these um, hurdles and blocks um, with our performance abilities and in, in, in our just just our the way we see ourselves as we're performing. Doug, any um, last thoughts before we break for today? Um, uh, just, just thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Ray. And thanks, everybody, for showing up and being uh, open to just totally new material. It's really, it's really great having that energy. And it's uh, always a pleasure. Cool. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Ray, for helping to create and produce this session. So Wishing everybody the best. Please stay healthy, stay creative, and stay connected. And we'll see you at the next session. Bye-bye.